Thank you, everyone, for coming in. My name is Ashish Dribari. I'm the founder and CEO of Axiomize, and I'll be talking about democratizing formal verification for RISC V. So we heard lots of nice talks this morning about how the Sci-5 talk and the other talks um, revolutionizing the RISC V uptake. So I will talk about how Axiomize is making the jump towards this direction. So I thought it might be useful to just um, share a bit of history. I founded Axiomize two years ago, um, been a global citizen for, for 20 odd years, lived and studied, uh, and worked in three continents and five countries, big cross-continental moves. I got into RISC-V this year, so I authored the RISC-V ISA formal proof kit. I've worked at OneSpin Solutions before I started doing Axiomize. I was heading the product team. But at the heart, I'm an engineer, still is an engineer. So I used to work at Imagination Technologies, pre previously General Motors, ARM, and Intel. Did my PhD with Tom Mellon in Oxford. Uh, focus was on problem reduction and formal verification. And I also happened to be lucky enough to get a visiting professorship at Southampton University between 2015 and 2018. So I've spent a lot of time dug in the trenches doing formal in all its glory, from theorem proving to property checking to equivalence checking. It's been a lot of fun innovating and filing patents and getting there. The vision I had when I founded Axiomize was to make formal easy for everyone in the industry to be able to get on with it because I was um, getting bored hearing that it's difficult, you can't do this, can't do that. So I said, okay, let me uh, find a way to make this happen, leave a well-paid job and start living off loans and start a new journey. So the idea here is that I train people how to do it. If people say, please come and also show me how to do this on projects, I do that. And the idea here is to do this in a vendor agnostic way. So I don't want to lock you into any specific tool and want to make formal predictable uh, there was a speaker from sci five who was saying about formal not being very predictable, et cetera, so there are methods of doing it. But essentially, my idea has been to democratize formal so that you can find it easy to use across any tool chain you like. And the vision is to be able to help this for everybody by 2025, which is 75 years since the first computer-generated proof. So how are we driving changes? As I said, we're doing trainings. Uh, I'm doing consulting work for clients. Um, in the training, I teach what I actually practice. Uh, there is no gimmicks, there's no marketing going on there. It's all methodology, hands-on. And in the services, when you don't have enough resources, um, I can do the work and get people to do the work. And then, as I said, this year, I started my life in the RISC V segment and wanted to try it out and see <laughs> what is happening in the RISC V. So this story is about RISC V. Uh, idea is to accelerate predictable and scalable formal verification. But actually, when I'm not doing RISC V, I'm working with big designs. And one of the designs I looked at last year was a design with a compiled footprint of 1.1 billion gates. Uh, and I was using Jasper in this case uh, from Cadence. Uh, but I actually ran this on other tools as well. And I could actually go to 4 or 8 billion gates as well. And this was full on functional verification without cut pointing, none of the other uh, things that people do. And it's end to end. Uh, so there's a methodology to do this. And in fact, methodology is the key for everything, including how we verify RISC V designs and how I actually started to do this this year. So as, you, as we all know that the open source uh, revolution is changing everything, CPU design is getting democratic. But actually, what about high quality verification? So Dennis uh, Brophy is sitting here and he's been involved in a lot of these reports uh, along with Harry. And there's a lot of data coming uh, from industry that VNV consumes nearly 70% time. So why will RISC-V be any different? Who's going to verify these processors? And I'm hearing a lot of very exciting uh, stories about people coming up with formal methodologies, simulation-based stuff. How are they going to be verified? Um, it's, it's easier to think that the ISA is free. I can go on and get my hands in it, take an open source core, change the core, add more extensions. But will it actually go in the field? Will it actually go in our cars or other devices? How much time will it take to verify this? What will be the cost? And who will ensure that bugs don't reach the silicon? All of the big names in the CPU area or GPU uh, industry who've been doing this for years have accumulated wisdom, skills, methodologies. They know how to get it right. In a system where we are evolving, how do we 
make sure that actually we can get it right. So what are the different verification challenges? So architectural is one. All instructions in the ISA work as expected. Only those instructions that are part of the uh, ISA are implemented no more. But actually, microarchitectural verification is equally important. So design optimization should not introduce any bugs. You may not actually have them captured in the specification up front. These are changes that designers like to make to minimize power, increase performance, minimize area. But we still need to make sure that there are no functional bugs, no dead logs, live logs, dead code, redundant code, underflow, overflow. This is the kind of language I use every day in the work that I do in uh, my other kinds of verification. So actually, if you start looking at it from a safety and security, which is becoming a big theme since the meltdown in Spectre and the ISO 26262 for automotive, we have to look at the collective of safety, security, power, and X checks. They're not the end all story. But actually, if you want to look at this, these issues are not mutually exclusive. In fact, the best figure I could find to describe what I think about them is the figure that you see. They're completely intertwined. And if you, have an, if you have an issue with an X, it could actually impact safety, security, power, or it could have a power bug that can actually impact the other. So in a way, these issues are completely intertwined. So if I wanted to actually map out my uh, uh, vision of how I see architectural and microarchitectural issues, the way I look at this is that there is a big overlap of defects in architectural space that can impact microarchitectural and other way around. The size of the circles don't indicate how big these issues are, but actually they are meant, they're laid out to show overlap. So if you have a deadlock in a microarchitecture space, it could impact power, power could impact deadlock. If you have an X issue that can actually impact both, um, lockstep verification can be an issue in architectural and microarchitectural space. So what I'm trying to say here is that the collective of architectural and microarchitectural is the one we should be aiming to verify. So I started looking at different risk five cores. I looked at the Shakti core last year. Um, and um, this year, I started to look at the cores from the Pulp Platform Group. They're very well documented. Um, the, the, the guys believe in what they do. They're very excited about it. So it was very easy to get myself started into this ecosystem. Um, and when I started this, I had a phone call with Lucia Benini, and he said, yeah, we have a zero risk key and risk key very well verified. We'd love to get feedback. Uh, some people have uh, verified them with formal, not found that many issues, but we'd love to, to find out more. So my take was, okay, it will be a good exercise for me to see what it is like to verify a RISC five core. Uh, and then IBEX was actually a project that started this year, uh, I think around April, May. I, uh, previous speaker talked about it, so I looked at that too. So it's a low power core, both zero risk key and IBEX. IBEX is almost a twin of zero risk key, at least at the time when I started to look at it in June. Um, implements the RB32 IC, ISA, um, two pipeline stages. You think of these designs and you think, how can you get them wrong, right? They're so small. Uh, you must be able to exhaustively verify them with simulation. But as the previous speaker was demonstrating that actually it still takes a lot of UVM cycles to verify them. Um, and low power brings interesting challenges around sharing and so on. So the problem is this, right? I'm sitting in the UK. Um, the team is in Zurich or Italy or maybe spread around the world. I haven't met these people before. I'm just looking at the design and I'm looking at specs. So I have questions. So I say, I'm missing some information. The guy on the phone says, what information? I say, I don't know. So I don't know what I don't know. The guy doesn't know what I don't know. And this is a typical situation in any DB project. So I have to come up with my questions, which have to be very precise to get a yes or a no answer. And this is a challenge that actually I have seen a lot in the field. So in this case, I, had to, I knew how to mitigate it, so my questions were fairly pointed. But there were moments where I had to uh, overcome my own personal ignorance about the S5 spec. So actually, the Pulp Zero Risk User Manual is pretty good. From my experience of working in the industry, uh, this was not a bad user manual. It's a user manual, it's not a spec. Uh, RISC five is a spec, but it's 145 pages. One is too short, the other is too long. And I'm sitting in the middle, in the wet United Kingdom, and thinking, how do I go about doing it? So because I've had some experience uh, working on different designs before, and one of the first things I teach, the people I teach in the industry is to follow a flow. So this is a flow I came up with this year, which is called ADEPT. 
It's about how you avoid bugs, how you detect bugs, how you erase bugs, and how you prove that they don't exist, and you tape out with confidence. And there are different things that you can do in this flow, from compiling the design in a formal tool to then detecting them. Um, and you know, when you compile the, the design, you actually start finding bugs like unreachable code, uh, initialization issues. So I ran this flow by default. And you know, in the detect mode, you, know, you can actually write some constraints and start looking for deadlocks. And actually, I'd found the first deadlocks one hour after I'd compiled zero risky. And I had a phone call with Lucha, and he said, you know, there might be spurious failures. And I said, I'm pretty sure they are, because it's been very well verified. Uh, but actually, they turned out to be real issues. Um, but erase and prove are the tricky bits. This is where a user has to write his own properties. And I think the sci fi speaker was mentioning how hard it is to write properties. And I agree, it is hard to write properties because you need to know what you're writing properties for. And so what you're writing for depends on specification, as I mentioned. So in fact, as I said, you know, the first set of verification was done in the first few hours of having compiled a design. I had already found issues that looked like genuine issues, but the designers had to confirm that they were genuine. I started to get a good feel because debug interface was broken on zero risky, and when I had found issues and contacted the designers, they admitted that this was not something that was finally, you know, was fully working. I don't know why it is not documented that way in the user manual, but at least it was an issue that I found. So going about the erase and prove mode and going beyond functional verification, I wanted to build something that actually could work across the vendor tools, easy to use, is predictable and scalable. So the natural choice was to use the RIS-5 ISA to build architectural properties that I can use to verify the architectural correctness, and then build some flows and checks that I can actually use to find that locks, issues in lockstep, and so on, and then do the full-on functional verification, interface checking, protocols, et cetera. So power and live locks were also an interesting thing that I was hoping to, to look at. So the idea is very simple. Take the ISA and turn this English specification in a document into formalized properties in system value log assertions, which is what this formal proof kit is. It has to be customized um, because there are signal names in this proof kit that actually define the mapping points of registers and the write and the uh, read data port, et cetera, for the memory interface. And this definition is done in the setup file. So usually for IBEX zero risky, it's about 15 to 20 lines of setup code that you can write, put it in the proof kit, put your design into a formal tool, and you start finding bugs, or you find a proof of bug absence. There are no question marks. There are no inconclusive proofs. You get everything 100% determined. So if I wanted to describe what this looks like, so I had 70 main properties, about 900 helper properties. Um, and usually the idea here that I had was to have full traceability of the ISA to the property space. So, uh, so cause effect model, each instruction is being modeled by a property, some exceptions being load stores and jump and link instructions. So the idea is quite simple conceptually. You say if there is a branch instruction and the values in register RS1 and RS2 is the same, then the, you expect the uh, value in the program counter in the next state to be the branch address. So, so anything on this slide is not rocket science. You can write it. I wrote it. Um, the signals that are prefixed with X mice are actually there to make sure you don't mix them up with your design signal names. And in fact, you write a property like this. What I've not shown in the SVA is that you have to put the guards around no interrupts, no exceptions, et cetera, so you can actually uh, monitor the data flow that you are actually trying to check. So for the, for the load store unit, which is more complex, you need an abstraction model for instruction cache and for data cache, which is what we did. And then I tested this with all the four tools that I have. The XMI is partners with, uh, with, with Cadence, Pentor, Synopsys, and OneSpin. And the way this works is there is a, there's a command called axiomize risk 5 and you supply three arguments to it. You say the first one is the top-level entity name. Say where it actually exists and the vendor that you would like to use. And a few seconds later, you will see an interface that looks like this. It will tell you which core you've chosen to verify, which vendor, where it is. And if you're happy with all of these settings, then you say yes. And you will then end up getting the tool running with all the proofs and bugs and so on and so forth, so you can use the tool you like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
so in the case of Mentor, for example, if you run this, you're likely to see a dashboard like this. Uh, usually when I'm doing a demo, this is the kind of dashboard I get in 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes. Um, I could actually carry on doing furthermore, and 80% of the properties would be proven in approximately two hours. This is when I'm doing exhaustive proofs, when there are no bugs. If there are bugs, I will be done in much shorter time. The LSU properties take a lot longer, um, and um, you know, in this case, uh, about 24 hours give and take. So the results are comparable with different tools, but some tools are better than the others, depending on the design. So I found loads of issues in Zero Risky, also tested Micro Risky, and Ibex. I wasn't surprised uh, with Ibex because it was under development, but the kind of issues I found was a little surprising. So one of the issues I found on Ibex um, was a branch of equal to, um, and it's one of the properties, one of the many that failed actually, and the idea why they failed were there was a similar pattern to it. And effectively what was happening was that the debug, if it was actually turned on in, during the execution of the decode, then actually all hell will break loose and the normal execution will go all over the place and you wouldn't get the expected result to happen. I was surprised because actually this wasn't the same case with Zero Risky, and remember Ibex was a very close derivative of Zero Risky. So initially I thought it was only a handful of properties, but then I found almost every instruction was affected. And actually, um, this is only seen when the debug arrives and the controller FSM is in the decode state. The precise timing of arrival of debug makes this bug really hard to catch in simulation because we just don't know when the debug would be kicked off. In fact, to convince myself that this can only happen in those conditions, I actually created a test case in formal to make sure that debug does not happen in this case, but can happen at all other times. And actually, you know what? The properties would happily prove exhaustively. So this bug only ever manifests in this precise way that I actually found. So it's quite hard to imagine you know, coming out in the field. It took seven cycles to catch it. Um, all the instructions were affected, as I said. Um, zero risky was interesting, right? So this was running in, uh, in an FPGA. I think it was already taped out in, in ASICs and, and so on. But actually, I couldn't get the load instruction to work as a load, and all my properties were actually failing. And I think the reason was that uh, they, by accident, the, uh, some of the code was left from risky world into the zero risky world which basically meant they were, had a custom instruction called reg, reg load, which was overtaking the effect of the normal <laughs> load. Uh, so later on, the designers confirmed it was an issue. And basically, in the way the RTL was written, once the instruction lo regular load was decoded, the reg, reg load would come along and would overwrite the effect, and then the right uh, branches of the MUX would not be taken. So I was a little surprised with zero risky, uh, given how well it was already verified before, but actually, with the tool that I have, it takes seconds to find these things. Um, but what about microarchitecture? So as I said, found issues with red locks. I couldn't get a lot of signals to toggle. Um, with X checks, found eight serious violations. All of this was actually uh, as in late August, early September timeframe. Things might have changed. I have not retested it since. Uh, Logs have found eight serious issues with IBEX. Um, Power was another interesting one. I was expecting an ARM-type valid-ready protocol behavior to hold on zero risky and IBEX, meaning if valid and not ready, then I wanted the payload to remain stable. But in this case, it isn't stable. Interestingly, it doesn't affect anything functionally. I've actually confirmed this. But it does mean that I can prove that it toggles, and I can also show you how many times it toggles, and I can also come up with a number to show you what power it will consume. And I think that was a way I could convince the designers that it was an issue they should take a look at. Um, security was another interesting one um, on IBEX. So, so my IT security is quite a complex topic, and you know you don't want to actually oversell it. But you know, in this case, the intent here is that um, the instruction is actually not working on zero risky the way we intend it to be, especially the load. So I believe it's a serious hassle. I'll skip the details on lockstep in the interest of time, but there's some analysis I did on uh, how we came up with this. And the issues I saw on IBEX are not the same on zero risky. In fact, on zero risky, there aren't any issues, but X's have been used in the, in the if-then-else's in the actual IBEX code. 
which then caused a lot of interesting behavior, multiple sources of the bugs. It took me quite some time to actually isolate this. Um, as I said, zero risky wasn't really an issue. So, I mean, an X usage is very common for low power, but you know, the checks have to still be done. The interesting thing is the architecturally, the core may still work correctly, but if you take two copies of that core, you will find differences in the output pins. How do we know you can trust me? Well, um, shouldn't trust me. In fact, with formal, everything is evidence-based, so you should take the kit, read out what the code is, run it, test it. All of these things on this slide are things that I did um, to test the quality of the code. So human review of all the instructions checked in the ISA have been implemented, all pass fails, consistency between different tools, structural coverage, functional coverage, hand-based mutation. Um, and most of the tools actually have ways and means to do it. Not consistently the same, but at least there is something in every tool that I tried. So in summary, um, what I would like you to leave with is we could accelerate predictable formal verification on RISC-V. Uh, we can find architectural bugs and microarchitectural. In formal, we don't go for a specific uh, simulation type traces. We check for all possible traces and interleavings. Every instruction that has been checked has been checked under the premise that actually any instruction could be active before or after. These, these checks are not done that only after reset I can do a load and I can only do a store. Any load that was checked was checked in under the guess that anything else could be active. So there's a lot that you get for your money and there's, there's not so much of a hassle. And you don't necessarily need to be a formal expert either, although I'm here to help you become one if you wanted from a training point of view. So you design, we verify using the tool of your choice or you take the kit, you design, you verify but make sure you actually verify before these things hit the silicon. That's all I had. Questions? So the way I look at this is that all of the properties are easily readable in a human form. If you don't understand SVA, it can be taught. And you can make a one-to-one -one correspondence between what exists in the ISA. And it is on a per instruction basis. Um, so I'm not that much worried about it being covering the ISA spec space. I'm more worried about whether or not the implementation does more than what the actual specification mandates, which is what I saw in the actual implementations. Uh, so at the moment, I did this myself by hand, um, but I'm just picking up on what else is going on. They could be extracted from a sale model or something else. It's certainly possible that they could be compiled out of them. I mean, at this point, for me, it was a, it's a start to see what it looks like to model. In fact, I wasn't even sure that I would be getting the results I got. Um, I mean, I know that people always tend to be a little bit dismissive about the core being small and big, but actually the cores, as small as they may be, they still can have issues about proof convergence. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, that's a good point whether you can actually, but I mean, my view is you can read this. You can take the stuff I've got and read it with your eyes and see whether or not it makes sense. So none of this is encrypted or anything. It's, it's sold as, it's not free, sorry, because I have to make money too, but it's sold unencrypted. So you can read the code, extend it, add things to it if you like, or come back and tell me that it was wrong and then we'll fix it.